<laughs> and Catherine, I'm going to start with you, and just to put sort of catapult um, in context, it's really to sort of help UK manufacturing, and it's the kind of support that you can give in terms of growth and research um, for manufacturing, but what is your sense of the big ticket items that you think the UK government needs to, to do now to help UK business grow faster? Thank you, Emily. Well, um, just to say, I'm originally born from Solihull, so I'm not sure I recognise the comments <laughs> made there. Um, but yeah, so big ticket items. First of all, I really was interested in what Ryan was saying about unlocking investment through pension funds. So a lot of what we do, we sort of bridge the gap between business and academia. We help companies with um, investment ideas, how to improve their productivity on manufacturing. But often some of the companies we work with, they just don't know where to go for finance. So we help direct them. We, we pride ourselves on our convening power, our collaboration, and, and actually business is learning from business. So that's, that's one thing. The other one, absolutely echo what's been said about talent. We do a lot of work on foresighting of future technologies. So hydrogen, do we have the right skill sets in this country to really ensure that we continue to be at the forefront of this? Digital skills, uh, heard earlier about digitalization, those are all top topics. And I'm sure we'll come later on to Brexit because there's quite a lot to talk about there as well, Emily. Um, shall we come on to it straight away, Deborah? <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it's not even an elephant anymore. It's no. properly here. And Ryan's laid out um, just where the gaps are emerging or, or sort of staring us in the face, really, in terms of trying to get that trade relationship um, back on track. Um, what would be the sort of first step now? What would you like to see as a concrete change? Well, I think we've taken a huge step in actually using the word Brexit because I don't know if anybody else noticed, but for a long time we just couldn't talk about it um, without everybody withdrawing away from it. So you can't solve your issue if you don't get to the root of it. It's not the only issue in the country, uh, but it is the one that I get talked to most about um, because what it feels like to business is it's something that didn't necessarily... They've got barriers that they didn't necessarily think they needed to have. A, a billion pounds worth. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's yeah. quite a barrier. Yeah, and I work with a lot of small businesses, you know, and at the start-up end, they're important. They're the Sunicorns. They're the ones who are, you know, hopefully going to grow into these huge, um, world-changing industries. Um, but they are really struggling with the uh, um, bureaucracy. You know, it's much harder for them to trade uh, with the EU. So for me, to cut a long story short, the most important thing we need to do is, is establish our relationship with the EU. I don't think anybody knows what it is at the moment. You know, we've kind of got this weird standoff relationship that, that business is just trying to find their own way. I'm going to address something that Lauren said. She talked about a jigsaw, mm. and I really recognise that. Because what I recognise is a lot of businesses actually not broken, mm. but the glue between those businesses broken. And for me, um, that's a very important part that we need to fix. You talk about collaboration, you know, businesses helping business, uh, you know, joining businesses together. So I think restoring our relationship with the EU mm. is incredibly important, or understanding what that relationship is, getting rid of those trade barriers. Uh, um, labour being, you know, the workforce being able to, to be mobile, those are the most important things. So when you talk about businesses finding their own way, and it really is a bit sort of stabbing in the dark at the moment, right? I mean, what are the sort of examples of people, businesses, industries that you're talking to, trying to find their way through the red tape or the costs or the delays or I mean have you got sort of examples at, of at the extreme level I've had businesses just giving up doing you know I'm talking small businesses you know they don't have a lot of people working with them you know they don't have huge departments to deal with it so they've literally said I'm not trading with the EU oddly I'm finding more people discussing with me how do we trade with the US you know it used to be our first market was the EU now they're saying well, actually how do we get into the US um, now that that's really that's not a good sign is it when we can't, we find it more difficult to, to trade with our nearest neighbour than to sell into the US. I mean, can they make up the difference that they're losing? It, it, I guess it's fine for them if it works, right? If, if US trade has become easier, then that was the vision of Global Britain. It hasn't become easier. The US trade hasn't become easier. 
EU trade has become more difficult. So, so, so they've switched to the next best thing. The honest truth is, in many of those instances, either I've had to help that funding or we've had to find funding mm. to actually get them through a very difficult period, simply because they are fundamentally good businesses. I know they're fundamentally good businesses. They have just got this, they've just got to find their way. Now, this has gone on too long. You know, it was all right saying, well, okay, it'll take 12 months, maybe it'll take two years. It's gone on too long. And a lot of these businesses are still trying to work out, actually, where's my markets? And then what happens is they focus on their home market and all of this wonderful opportunity, all of these businesses that could take over the world, all they do is say, do you know what? It's really too hard. I can't find the way I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sit in my own area. That's not good for Britain. So they're sitting and, and still doing business? or they're Still just... doing business. You know, all of the business, they're still doing businesses. I personally think that they've had their potential chopped off. You know, that they are businesses that could take over the world, but they're yeah. struggling with funding. They're struggling with the trade barriers that we talk about. Um, and in the absence of a sort of a clear vision and a clear relationship, they've drawn their horns in. Um, Siobhan, let's, let's talk about where technology comes into this, because AI is always spoken about with a mixture of sort of admiration complete fear are we doing the right sort of thing at the moment for business to, to harness technology um, so one of the great things about this job uh, running the chambers is I spend a lot of time traveling the country meeting businesses big and small and you know there's a lot of optimism out there they are entrepreneurial can do solution orientated businesses but what you do see is in the, we've got some short-term issues and we've got some long-term economic challenges. And on digital, on AI, firstly, there is not enough understanding of what the opportunities are, even, you know, even basic you know, technology rather than what AI is going to bring us. I mean, huge opportunities, you heard from Tony. So there's not enough understanding. Then there aren't really the skills. So even if I want to implement a new large piece of software, how do I do it and where do I go? So there's a huge adoption and skills challenge in terms of taking up. So, so let me just press you a bit more on that. When you say there aren't the skills, we're not training people in, in, in AI enough now? Or, or do you mean that people aren't, there isn't the sort of the space for them to develop what they want to do? What, what is so it's, it's, it's a combination of things. So on the skills front, you know, when I travel the country, the number one issue that people talk about is getting people with the right skills. That is, that is holding us back from And growth. what does that mean in sort of, in, in the simplest terms? It means, terms? It what means that you, that we're we either, we're not fulfilling our order books, we're not growing our business, and skills, I mean, it's, it's broad, but digital and green are the main two areas. So. Uh, one of the things that we are running across the UK is a thing called local skills improvement plans. That is, uh, it, sound, you know, it sounds simple, but it's going out and asking businesses what gaps they have now and what skills they'll need for the future, which, by the way, is very hard for a lot of businesses to say, and then working with our education system to teach those things so that we have a workforce that's ready for the future. Uh, but that's a long-term thing, right? That's going to take some years to come about. Um, on the future of the economy, we need to be thinking about issues right now. So, general election in a, I'm not taking bets, but a year, 18 months' time. We need to be thinking about the opportunities that AI brings, as well as the issues. We need to be thinking about global Britain, our trade and inward investment, our people and skills, like a long-term skills programme. We need to be thinking about our high streets and the importance of our local local economies and communities and the you know the green revolution so we do need to get to net zero that's really important but there is a huge opportunity for UK PLC if we can grasp it in terms of new products and services in you know in the green in the green economy um, and, and Catherine when just to go back to this whole question of skills I mean we've heard you know, Rishi Sunak say we need to do more on maths and then I think just yesterday he was talking about capping the degrees that don't sort of yield, yeah. you know, the most lucrative jobs in 18 months. I mean, where would you start now if you were, if you were saying what UK manufacturing needs from schooling, from training, from university courses, what's the sort of the pinnacle of what 
what you need to see? Well, if I could link two things there, because one of the other aspects of the, the big ticket items is obviously investment in science and technology, in research and technology. We saw the graph earlier where we stack up as a, as a country. Um, the government has committed to increasing the share of GDP, and I know there's going to be lots of conversations about that later today, but we need to continue to see that increase. And I, I am quite an optimistic person. I heard Tony Blair say that he is generally. I am generally. And I think the real thing, we need to, those young people that were talking earlier, mm. we want them to feel that they can move and get a career in STEM, working in science and technology, helping us with the problems that Siobhan was talking about on Net Zero, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute. Just one example for you. Before I ran the catapult, I was at Airbus. And at Airbus, in the big factory in North Wales, we've got these automated movers that move these huge wings around. And the best people at working those are the guys who know about how to play video games <laughs> because they've got a different skill set that you wouldn't traditionally look for. So we want people to feel that they, come, they can come in and help industry and help develop, bring their ideas in. Everyone's laser focused on net zero. Let's get those people in, encourage more innovation in this country. And I love the idea of bringing different people in who wouldn't traditionally be in the sector in which I operate. So it sounds like it's not something... I mean, I remember there was a sort of whole... Um, push to get kids who knew Minecraft, you know, yeah. into designing, you know, exactly the, sort of the next generation of, of digital and technology. But it sounds like that's not something that necessarily comes from schools then. I mean, it's not something you change in the curriculum. It's interesting. One of my colleagues is actually off today to Silverstone to talk about this formula student. So it's yeah. getting people, you know, think of the, the love, the passion that people have for motorsport, encouraging people who have that passion in that kind of activity to realise that they, should, they can come and, and get a job in our industries. I think the digital skills are important. There's a, a, a theory I've been talking about recently about fearing the fear, the feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Some people are about scared about moving into digital. So we've got some great examples I can share with you. One in Sheffield, which I know you're from, Emily. You know, a company who realise they just have to spend a thousand pounds to tweak a machine to obtain the data, which I know is very important for the Tony Blair Institute, using data more wisely to help improve their productivity, help reduce costs and actually create jobs. And just to go back, Siobhan, when you're talking about the sort of people being nervous about not having the skills for the future, I mean, are these people who sort of want to, you know, in, in sort of midlife are now trying to retrain or are they just people who kind of see AI coming towards them and think, I'm going to be out of a job? I mean, how... How helpful are we being currently in saying, yeah, that might not exist, but this, will, this door will open? I think that story is very much still being written. And that's why I think we need to begin to establish what that narrative is. We're already hearing businesses saying, you know, I can already see my workforce changing dramatically, and what are those people going to be doing instead? I mean, it's scary. Right? Yeah. I mean, if, you're yeah. Of, if, if you're part of an industry that you know is disappearing. It is. But then on the other hand, if you think about planning, I mean, the reason, one of the reasons that we are really struggling with planning at the moment is because we don't have any planners. Right. But you can actually see quite quickly how AI could build a system for you that could run things much more smoothly through, through a planning process. What we need to do, and this is one of the things we're beginning to see through these skills work, particular skills, digital, green, call it what you like, are of course important, but actually, a lot of our young people aren't even ready for work. And whether you're, I mean, 16, they were amazing, 25 or 55, what we need to teach people is what we call the three Cs. So critical thinking, communication, and confidence. And that will give you the mindset that you can learn anything, right? Because again, even these young people, what they're doing in 20 years' time or 40 years' time is going to be entirely different to what the world looks like now. So we've got to teach people that mindset of change. And is that a curriculum change? Uh, yeah, it has to be built into the curriculum. It has to be built into the ways of thinking about the curriculum and how we... I mean, we still teach... Well, we're going to hear about it later from Sal Khan, right? We're still teaching our kids in the way we did in the Victorian times. My oldest has just taken his A-levels... And when I was looking at the structure of his answers, I realised that they're teaching him to structure his answers the same way they taught me. I mean, I know I only look 25. <laughs> but exactly. you know. I think it's, it's to your benefit. Yeah. <laughs> so, really, we're still teaching our kids... You know, we're the transition generation, right? So, I grew up without technology. Mine grew up 100% with it. 
we are trying to teach our kids stuff that really, truthfully, we don't really understand because we didn't grow up with it. And that is what we really need to get our heads around. When you look around the world, Deborah, who's, who are the pace setters? Who are the, who are the people? Who are the, where are the countries that are really, really there to teach us something? So I think, that, um, for me, the most important thing is when you join a, a sound economic policy with a sound social policy. So, so the measuring of uh, success being economy along with the well-being of people. We don't do that. We just talk about GDP. We just report on cash all of the time. Um, and what, actually, when you look at countries that do join that well, um, you're looking at, you know, the Singapore's of this world, and they have a good, you know, they have a very healthy economy. Um, they have a very free and open economy. Um, good regulation, but not too much regulation. Um, uh, and they join that with, with caring about their society. You've got uh, Ireland, you know, where, where, that's, come from, that's come from nowhere to, to having a you know, nice, healthy, thriving economy, economy and caring about its people. So uh, one of the pleas that I make is that we change the way we measure our GDP. We look at not just cash, because what is the point of money? I always say to business, what's the point of running a business? It's about building the life that you want to build and the life that you want to have. That is the same with an economy. What's the point of an economy? It's not to say how, that's how much money we've got. It's to say this is what we can do for the people that live within it. Um, so I think the joining of those two is very important. And there are some countries doing it well. And we at the moment are not. You know, we are, we are, and even actually in our conversation today, we're talking cash. You know, and what we should be talking about is the outcome of that cash. You know, how it makes people, um, how it makes people so Keir Starmer was writing yeah. The Observer at the weekend, we've got to prioritise economic growth. I mean, he's kind of spelled it out. Do you, think, do you think that's the wrong track? I mean, do you think it's the wrong emphasis? Well, we, of course, listen, I'm a business person. I get completely, you know, a business isn't business if you don't have profit. I completely get that. You need cash to do a lot of the things. But alongside that, and all of the businesses that I work with and talk to, alongside that, you know, are we creating jobs? Are people working within us? Are they happy? You know, are they healthy? Is there, and these are the very same things that an economy should be looking at and should be constantly measuring. You know, are we, are, is our country a happy place to be? Because right, because that's all that this money should be doing. It should make, be making us healthy. It should be making us happy. When you're healthy and happy, you you work better. You contribute more. Society feels better. So I think the joining of those is really, really important. But, but that is a utopia, isn't it? I mean, that I don't, is I don't a know utopia. Who, I don't know which citizen <laughs> from which country would say our country is? Happy and rich and healthy. No, but it's something that we can aim at, and starting to talk about them in the same sentence is a start towards that. Because you, because if you just measure cash, mm -hmm. if we just talk about GDP in terms of money, you have got a whole plethora of people out there going, A, I don't really understand what GDP is, but I, I know I'm hurting, and I don't think they care about me. So society only gets better. When, when, when everybody believes that we're all working for the same thing, even if it's not right, but we are working for the same thing. Yes, it's utopia. There is nothing wrong with aiming at utopia and just taking the steps towards it. And Catherine, one of the places... Um... <laughs> I think there's a lot of support for that optimism. I mean, that's the first start, isn't it? Um, I guess one of the places you find that is changing your priorities, as you were saying, and you say net zero. You know, the climate change measures are the thing now that is going to get us to the place where we are in a, in a healthier, more respectful environment. Do we need to, to say green jobs, whatever that costs, is the future. We need to actually start transferring everything we're doing along the direction of, of what mitigates climate change. I think this is a real opportunity for the UK. Um, I have the honour of also chairing a regional powerhouse called the Western Gateway, which is all about uh, West of England and South Wales. And we call ourselves being the green energy powerhouse. So we're looking at the power of the River Severn. Um, obviously, nuclear. We had a big announcement from the government just this morning about nuclear. We're all very concerned about energy. Many of our customers, I'm sure a lot of your members, Siobhan, are very, very concerned about energy costs. But we actually, we have got an incredible opportunity with um, wind power as well, which I think, from my side of things, the organisation I run, we're really looking at getting the design 
done here, which is what we've always been really fantastic at at this country. And unfortunately, um, it's sometimes seeping overseas. So we want the design done here, then you get the manufacturing done. And the other thing I would add on that is the work on supply chain, and that links quite nicely into the Brexit story. We, and during COVID as well, we were all affected by resilience issues. So that's one thing that my organisation can really help with. And that's where net zero, if we get the suppliers lined up, we do a lot of work in encouraging companies who maybe were in other sectors to move into these, what we call sunrise industries, into hydrogen, into nuclear, into tidal power. This is, we're an island. We've got fantastic opportunities. As was listed on the slide earlier, we've got great universities, many of whom are market leading. So let's build on that enthusiasm. I'm generally an optimistic person, I have to say. So, so, what, so what's stopping us there? I mean, we have it all, right? We have amazingly creative minds. What's actually, does that go back to planning? There's a lot, of, a lot of, the infrastructure is a, a very important aspect and planning has been talked about earlier. I do think, and I, you know, with the Western Gateway work I do, I see how important it is to get people around a table who are laser focused on getting investment in our area. Building on what uh, Deborah said about pride, I mean, I really see that in a region. If a lot of people decide in the West Country we're used to nuclear power, we're actually happy to have a nuclear power station in our community, then that really helps. So it's this sort of multi-focus and, and engineering desire to get that done here. So that's one thing. Planning's another thing. And also, as I said earlier, investment in research and technology that can help engineers do the great things. I just want to say on the Elizabeth line, Let's congratulate the engineers who helped design and make that, because we should be proud in our engineering footprint in this country. And Siobhan, I don't want to bring your 18-year-old or your, your A-level son back into this too much, but in the context of what we have been hearing um, about the next steps that young people are taking and whether... I mean, I don't think the government actually called them Mickey Mouse courses, but there's been this sort of sense that, that we should be capping the courses at university that don't yield lucrative enough jobs. I mean, just trying to understand, you know, where Deborah's coming from, which is like, forget about that, you know, go to the place that will make us fulfilled and, and rich in other ways. Do you feel, I mean, do, do businesses that come to you feel <coughs> that they are getting the sort of the wrong degrees or that degrees are not as useful as we all maybe have, have sort of been led to believe or, or have believed. Where, where do you stand in terms of apprenticeships versus sort of hard academic versus training on the job, you know? Yeah, yeah. So businesses will tell you, tell us they need, they need a mix of skills, right? We need some young people who have, you know, gone on to education and further education. We saw the young girl today who's starting her MA, you know, in London. So we always need that. As a nation, though, what we haven't had is that balance so the bit where we go back to apprenticeships and technical education, T levels are a good thing. We need more of that and we need to believe that apprenticeships are equally as good as A levels and a degree. So it's a question of skills and balance. You know, optimism is a really underrated leadership skill in my view. And as you say, we see it everywhere as business leaders around the country. And if we come back to sort of one thing that we'd like to see, unlocking the planning system, let's use AI to do it, will mean, and planning's sort of boring, but it means <laughs> more infrastructure, right? It means more housing, which means more jobs. And let's remember, 80% of our economy is SMEs. They are local businesses in places, employing people, looking after them. Mm. Not necessarily growth for growth's sake, but Thriving businesses mean thriving local economies. Siobhan Haviland, Deborah Meaden, and Catherine Bennett, thank you all thank very you. much indeed. Thanks for the